Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's Beachside Chat hosted by the UCLA Rapid Rigorous Relevant Implementation Science Hub funded by NIMH. Uh, hi, Russ. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, this is, I've been really looking forward to this. My name is Allison Hamilton. I lead the hub and have the very good fortune of having been part of this group uh, that convened um, over five years ago uh, to advance qualitative work in implementation science. And we're at about our five year uh, anniversary. And so thought it might be a good time to reconnect and um, talk about what everyone's been doing lately. For anyone who hasn't participated in a Beachside Chat previously, um, we host these events approximately four times a year, uh, and they're really meant to be an informal dialogue with leaders in the field on various topics. Uh, they are all uh, recorded and on our YouTube playlist, which I'll show you at the end of our session. Um, we welcome comments, questions, insights from the audience. Uh, I have a couple of questions that I'll be posing to our illustrious panelists, um, but it really isn't a formal presentation. Uh, it's meant really just to truly be a chat and it's actually modeled after the fireside chats that Dr. Chambers was doing uh, several years ago. And he was a big, um, played a big role in bringing this group together and um, providing the space for us to develop a white paper that's available on the NCI website, which I will show you the link to in just a moment. Um, if I took the time to give all the titles and backgrounds of everyone in this group, it would probably take the full hour. Uh, I think they are known to all of you and um, folks can do introductions as we respond to different questions. I'm just gonna share a couple of quick slides and then we'll come out of slideshow mode and chat. So uh, our topic is qualitative research and implementation science. Our group is affectionately called QualRIS. Uh, for short, uh, we're reflecting on the past five years and the future. I want to welcome um, those from our group who were able to join and who you see on the screen. And uh, two of our members were unable to join today, Dr. Deb Cohen and Ms. Laura Damschroeder. Um, they are very much a part of what we all accomplished together, but just weren't able to join today. And you see at the bottom here um, the link to the white paper that we developed. So uh, it's still freely available, thanks to NCI. And um, we hope that it is uh, still providing valuable guidance to the field. So toward the end, I will show a couple more slides with citations from our panelists, just a handful. Again, that would take like hundreds of slides if I put everyone's uh, entire uh, portfolio on these slides. Um, so we'll come back to the slides a little bit later, but for now we're going to come out of the slides and talk. Okay, so, um, Welcome again. And I think uh, just starting by kind of reflecting on where we thought things would be going um, when we produced that white paper, we, you know, not only laid out um, what we thought was different about qualitative methods in implementation research, uh, some features, uh, many of us are anthropologists, um, and other social scientists and qualitative methodologists, and we had been doing uh, quite a bit of work in our own areas um, to adapt and adjust uh, and tailor methods uh, to do the type of work that we do in implementation research. And that was a big part of our agenda was to um, lay out those features. And we had some thoughts as to what we would recommend for the future. Uh, we recommended um, more transparency and team-based analysis. Uh, stronger tools for rapid qualitative work, um, using other qualitative methods in implementation science and other paradigms like phenomenology. Uh, we recommended developing a common language and developing approaches for cross-context comparison and synthesis. And so I would like to kick us off by asking you all 
how you think we've done as a field in these areas, where you think we've made any advances um, and any examples of how and where we've moved forward and anyone can start. Dead, dead silence. I'll, I'll start. Hey, Larry. And so I hate uh, being in a vacuum, <laughs> seeing all your faces and not hearing anything. I was counting on someone to feel that way. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you one of the things that I've seen, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, both Allison and I have contributed to it, but uh, I've certainly seen it in a lot of venues now has been uh, a, more of an emphasis on both ethnographic research and implementation science and doing it a little quicker than we as anthropologists were trained to do ethnographic research. So nobody has time to spend a year or two uh, in the field, so to speak, uh, uh, most of which is spent learning the language because we're relatively familiar with the language. but. Uh, we've all been, I think, uh, working to develop techniques for doing uh, rapid ethnography, uh, graphic methods, uh, both in terms of data collection and data analysis. Um, I think it's not only a reflection of how our thinking has evolved in the field, but uh, how um, the, the rest of the discipline has really taken hold of this work in terms of adopting it for their their own. So um, seeing the references to the paper that uh, Allison did with Aaron Finley, for example, uh, seeing the uh, uh, efforts by the folks in the, uh, the UK on um, publicizing and um, you know emphasizing the the value and importance of ethnographic methods. Uh, I, I'm increasingly being asked to provide training to uh, NIH-funded investigators who are doing mixed methods research and want to do something above and beyond the traditional focus groups, semi-structured interviews. Um, but more importantly, it's uh, providing some rigor uh, to the process, so both with respect to how information is collected, as well as um, how you know we can go beyond simply the old um, uh, and vivo and Atlas TI forms of data analysis. To uh, as Allison is spearheaded, that uh, in a way that can be just as rigorous as the way that uh, we've been using uh, these techniques, uh, and the software programs in the past. Uh, so I think we've made a lot of progress in that particular area, at least. Yeah, Ben, thank yeah, you, Larry. So, so I, I, I really agree with that. And, you know, I think, uh, qualitative has really become almost normalized in implementation science, you know, so it's an expectation I think there's a couple of people on the screen here that are exploring more participatory research that I think is where we, you know, is where we need to go. And, you know, that, which is more challenging because, you know, by engaging uh, communities because it, it, it's disruptive to traditional designs. I'd love to hear I know Jennifer. I know you've been doing this, and uh, so kind of because I think this is a big place for qualitative to go. Yes. <laughs> so I I'm a great believer in, um, and particularly if we want to scale up our implementation widely, um, building the capacity of people in practice to do some of the data collection um, and. Uh, so one of the ways we've been doing that is aligning implementation strategies with quality improvement methods. So we're using the language and the tools that our practice partners are comfortable with. And then they do, we, we coach them and support them as they do um, uh, PDSA cycles and um, process mapping, um, and um, root cause analysis, whatever. And, and then we do things like um, periodic reflection, 
um, some interviewing, some document review, looking at the notes of the coaches that are going in and working with these teams to collect knowledge across multiple settings. Um, and the benefits, not only are we talking in a language that our practice partners are familiar with, we're also building their capacity to continue to collect um, data to improve their processes. I, I'm, I'll finish in a minute. I also do capacity building is another area that I work in where we do trainings with practitioners and demystifying. I mean, there's a lot of sense that to do collect qualitative methods and to do it rigorously. I mean, but you can get really man meaningful qualitative data to improve what you're doing. And it, it can be demystified in a way that's not scary and that you can really, so, so there's a tendency when you work with practices with people on the ground, like in health departments, that it has to be a survey or something. And to convince them that actually you could probably get much better data if you just talked to people. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, Suzanne. <clears throat> So we really brought out of retirement for this. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. Um, I had been reading some of the papers you sent, uh, Ben, and I was very impressed with the idea of sort of an internal focus for leading uh, implementation research and leading a qualitative uh, investigation. At the NIH, for years, we focused on community-based participatory research. That's nothing new. But I think there's a new emphasis, a uh, change in maybe um, power dynamics between the, the sort of top-down methods and design and so on and more of uh, a lo what works locally uh, for a, a, an investigation. And, and I think that's happening and I think we need lots more of it. So. Thank you so much. I'm Borsika. I'm calling you out because you've been doing so much of that work if you, uh, if you wanna weigh in. Thank you so much. I just love to listen to this very, very illustrious group. And uh, I was at the time of the report as well, more of an applic app applier or user of these techniques and very excited that I got the chance with multiple projects to apply some of these, including the ones that were already highlighted work that you, Alison, did with um, Aaron uh, around periodic reflections, the rapid techniques, matrices, and all other ethnographic approaches I am very intrigued, and it's more of a question to the group, how do we engage community members in this work? And so a couple of different ways that we tried, but I don't know if that is the, you know, the ideal way is to have them input on the instruments that we use. So we definitely want to hear from them whether the questions that we are planning to ask, whether it's a survey or an interview guide, is meaningful to them. The other way that we have been thinking about is co-creation and basically engaging them in thinking about alignment. Um, Russ is on the call and uh, we have done some work together on the PRISM using the PRISM uh, framework and thinking about alignment in a structural way that has a qualitative component to it. But what can the community do? And then I will mention one more thing and I would love to hear from you all. When communities were actually trained in doing analysis of qualitative data, promotoras in the SEAL initiative. We did not do that. UC Riverside did a beautiful job of training the promotoras who took great pride in doing the analysis and creating themes and, and thinking about it. So I would just love to hear from you all who are doing much deeper work in this area. What is the right way or what are some good strategic ways to engage community members? I, um, I think that is an incredibly important question. And um, to me is one of the, should be a top priority for implementation science moving forward. Um, and I'll just say, um, we've been giving a lot of thought to that in a study that's funded by NHLBI. And to really, um, we have a community coalition and we have patient advisory groups, but where I think we're really moving forward is, um, thinking about how do we assess the engagement work we're doing and how it's contributing to the implementation science 
So both the quality of the engaged relationship, but also um, we are having them um, engaging the community in adapting the intervention, but also in tailoring the implementation strategies. So ex really documenting what, how that's happening. How is the community providing that input and how are we leveraging that? So really important. Yeah. And, and we need to get beyond just thinking of grants. It's, it's community is not, doesn't work on a grant timeline. And so you need to be, it, it's ongoing engagement. Uh, it, it's longitudinal. It, it's, uh, you know, and it's all about relationships. And, you know, that, uh, so it's not, I've got an idea as an academic and an imply, you know, and saying, okay, let's go out to the community and find partners. You know, it's really kind of having a lot, you know, really being engaged with people over an extended amount of time. No, Larry. Um, just uh, two examples, uh, Borsica, I think of the kinds of things you're looking for. Ben and I have been collaborating on a project being led by a colleague of ours at uh, USC ha having to do with uh, scaling up um, HPV vaccination uh, for you know uh, children and adolescents. And uh, along with a colleague of ours, Tom Mackey, we've been using content mapping as a way of identifying, you know, what the community feels are the most appropriate strategies uh, for implementing, um, it, you know, vaccine requirements. And we found that uh, it, it's not only been engaging, but it gives them a little bit of structure. So we talk about co-creation all the time, uh, but oftentimes people are left wondering, well, how does that exactly play out in real life? And even with um, the effort that we did, it involves some modification of the traditional concept mapping exercise. But we found that now that we've moved into uh, actually implementing or using the strategies that they've recommended, um, how we've been able to develop that relationship with our community partners much quicker than we would have otherwise. Um, and another example with respect to the ethnographic methods, uh, you know, we tailored uh, the, the RAPIS method, which was originally designed to train clinicians to be ethnographers, to train community members to participate in the ethnography process, either as participant observers or as analysts. And we've been doing this uh, in a collaboration in New York where we recently were looking at the challenges of trying to implement uh, uh, medication for opioid use disorders when there's a hurricane and you know everything is closed. And uh, the community-based organizations we've been working with have played a much greater role in both directing data collection, uh, but but leading the data analysis rather than following our lead uh, in, in a way that really is uh, transformative uh, in, in how our understanding of implementation really does play out on the ground. Thank you so much, Larry. Yes, Heather, I was just about to turn you to you. Call on me. Your work <laughs> picks up on like all of these threads. Uh, so yeah. yeah. I was trying to figure out where to start, but um, <laughs> I think one of the things is since Qualrus, um, I've joined a CTSA. I'm at the University of Iowa. And so um, that has real, it's called stakeholders, community and stakeholder engagement in the CTSA world, um, which, you know, there's a lot of debate about that word. But one thing that it's pushed me to think about is, um, really broadening what that means. And so working with basic scientists, um, with industry partners, with um, communities, with patients. Um, and so a lot of my work is actually working with people who have never thought to think about these mm -hmm. stakeholders in their research and to try to think about um, where the implementation implementation and where is their science going really, really early on in the process. And so we talk about engagement from 
other scientists that they haven't talked to yet or, um, you know, other clinicians where it's going to end up being implemented um, really early on in the process. So um, expanding what engagement means um, and what what we see as community. Um, and I don't want to take away the deep roots of community engagement either. And so, but it it's applying it in a different way. And then I just want to say that I heard this from a really great community engagement researcher to uh, play off what Ben was saying. Um, it is, if you are working in a community, it's not just about the grants, it's about going to their galas, it's about going to their fundraisers, it's about going to their events um, and to, to build real relationships. And so I just wanted to steal it from someone that I do not remember her name, but it was such a great uh, example of how we do that on an ongoing basis. And I'm, I'm sure I'll jump in with other things as we're going. Yeah, but I think our, our colleague Galatru's work is a great example of that too. You know, going to events where things are happening that you're also happening to study, but um, being a meaningful uh, and active member of, of communities, which Deb Paget, I know you are, you have a very long history of, I also know you don't feel too well. So if you're not feeling like jumping in, it's okay. But anything you want to add? Well, you know, my work has been largely around housing first and, you know, interviewing people in housing or not in housing. But for that very reason, I've had trouble finding a way of defining community uh, when people are mainly in the study by virtue of their status of being in a, in a certain program. So I'm, I did mean that I was coming to, to learn here as much as to <laughs> offer, but I'm glad, I'm glad I finally made it in. We are too. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to check the chat and see if anyone has. Okay. I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet. Yes. Potlucks. Um, and a comment that the issue of community engagement is vital, but it can be better when we start looking at the community beneficiaries as the actual implementers, not the NGO staff or nurses. The implementer is that person who will take medicine on time. Great comment. Anyone have any thoughts or responses to that? Just a very quick note, and this is all I am learning from you and I'm learning from our community partner. We have uh, been working with the social change organization, the Global Action Research Center, Nicole Stanik and myself, and they have been working with communities between the two leaders a cumulative 80 years. They have academic background, but they moved into the community as community organizers, Paul Watson and Bill Oswald. And the, the things we learned from them are so, seems to be so basic, but it's so essential. And we are not thinking of that when we design our methods. It's the need to reach people who are under the clay line, people who are the least likely to be at the table and hear their stories. Because often the solutions that we propose are based on the people who are already reached broadly in the community. So their work has been to find those individuals who are, again, least likely at the table. And often these are obviously refugees, uh, immigrants, people who came to this country not too long ago who don't have the language skills, and young people, actually. They emphasize that young people are often not at the table, and especially in traditional communities, their voice is not heard as well. The senior members of the community speak. So I think that finding a way to bring those people, and I think this answers a little bit to that comment, um, and get their input is so critical. And we don't do that often because it's so hard to do. And so having the right people to help you make that those attempts to include those people at the table and then slow down. I think um, Ben mentioned it and others as well that, you know, we can't go with the speed of research. We have to go with the speed of the community. And I find that challenging in the context of NIH funding, for example, because we have deadlines. So lots to learn for me, but I uh, really appreciate all the examples that you have all shared. Oh, I just want to say one thing. Um, I'm on a project where we use one of our catchphrases is move at the speed of trust. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's great. I just wanted to say not everything is a community, but that doesn't mean you can't still focus on the 
local participants, the people who stand to benefit from the research. Um, you can provide a, a patient sample from a clinic. You can look at people sample a neighborhood if you're doing environmental studies. It doesn't always have to be a community, but you can still reach the people who are least, as you said, least likely to be at the table and, um, and whose voices need to be heard. One thing you were talking about, um, how do you get people to be involved in designing a, a, an instrument? I think you need to get people involved before then. I think you need to get people involved in deciding what the question should be and the design uh, at the very beginning, because that I think that really um, shows communication with the, the, the people you're trying to help. Absolutely. Um, and I, uh, I see a couple of comments in the chat, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, one thing that I just wanted to pick up on that I've been thinking about a lot is the, is the speed issue, uh, because I have done so much related to rapid qualitative methods. And I find it myself with folks here and, and folks uh, in the audience as well, who um, we are um, doing more and more in the ethnographic direction, which of course trained as an anthropologist is not known for speed. Um, and I, ha I have a bit of a tension in my own, you know, kind of thoughts about how to do this work, because the idea of slowing down is 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 catching hold in a lot of different you know areas of of research, social justice research, equity oriented research. You know, not trying to be so fast and so speedy and so rapid. Um, and so I feel like, you know, how am I going to reconcile that? <laughs> Since I've I've built a lot on on rapid methods, which I really do believe in and which have been really valuable. And and it it just feels like sort of a um, a, a, a tension to me, a, not a bad tension, a tension where there can be a lot of growth and development, but uh, just something that I, I've been pondering a lot. Yeah, Ben. But uh, one of the things that uh, we've been doing, that, you know, so there is this rapid getting data and feedback, but then you can still go back to the data and do a more thorough analysis later. Yeah, you know, so so uh, you know, there's one thing is being able to give rapid uh, assessments, feedback. I think you know it's and we're being seeing more and more of this with learning evaluations and other kinds of mo implementation science models where the qualitative is being uh, collected and there is a rapid analysis. But then you can step back and do a more thorough analysis later. Right. And I I try to make that point often <laughs> and strongly, but um, but you know, rapid is appealing uh and 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 for good reason. So um I think it's just a great reminder, Ben, that we the data's not going anywhere, what is what I often say. Heather, I think you had a comment as well. I put it in the chat. I was just okay. saying you're were, you were adapting to your community. I mean, <laughs> the speed issue is an issue of who you're working with and who yeah. is your audience and who are you trying to impact? And so, yeah, when you're in a hospital setting sometimes or um, a big policy setting, uh, they have to make decisions um, with as best information they can. And often qualitative research can give them really in-depth information to make those decisions in a rapid way. So I don't right. wanna, I don't want you to um, throw that out with your tension, which I agree is part of it. Thank you. I see Jennifer and Larry are are uh, having thoughts. I'll be, um, two things in the comments. One, the um, what is community? And we have ex very specifically said, we are defining community as um, the patients, the clinic, staff and providers and the wider community are all community. And we use different approaches to engage those different levels. And then on the question of speed, um, I don't, I think you need, 
to go slow on the relationship development and on, but fast on the data collection. Mm -hmm. People don't want to sit around and wait. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, yesterday I, I taught my first class at UCSD in 19 years, uh, having left, uh, returned to UCSD after being at USC for so many years. And we were having our students, it's a health policy implementation class, and we were having our students uh, review the paper by Enola and David Chambers is on it on the, the framework to assess speed of translation in health. And the very issue about, uh, uh, and it also relates to a comment in the chat that I saw from uh, uh, Felipe Castro about uh, uh, negotiating between rigor uh, and the community demands. But as you know, policymakers always want the information yesterday um, because their timeline is very different from the five-year funding cycles that, that we have as researchers. So. Um, when we're working with the community, uh, particularly policymakers, we don't have the luxury of going slow uh, like we did in the past. And of course, there has been an inc uh, increasing push beyond qualitative methods um, in providing answers quickly. Um, but we still need to exercise rigor in doing that. And of course, ultimately it involves a negotiation, a process of debate and compromise. Uh, when we're collaborating uh, and co-creating with community members. But I think uh, we have an advantage as qualitative researchers um, because that's always been characteristic of the way that we've have approached asking questions and uh, you know uh, using uh, and working with community members as partners to answer those questions. Absolutely. I'm going to just uh, take a peek at the chat. I know there's some great stuff happening in there. And I think you uh, touched on Felipe's question, Larry. Thank you. And Corey, I see your comment about acknowledging that implementing staff and volunteers are critical agents in social relations that produce implementation. Absolutely. Aubrey, I see your, your comment about uh, keeping pace with the speed of practice. <laughs> um, and there is a special issue on that topic. Uh, just um, looking at Corey, your point about interpreting rapid as accessible um, and not linked burdensomely to expectations of science. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point too, Heather, um, you know, I feel, I still feel, um, you know, all these years after uh, starting to work on rapid more um, intensively that we we have such a an opportunity and a gift to um, you know have our work our qualitative work our qualitative methods be seen as valuable to people who are making decisions often at speeds that we don't tend to make decisions and that they would be turning to us and saying we want the qualitative work we want the qualitative data I think is is a responsibility and it is. Um, you know, just sort of perpetually exciting, I think, for us to figure out, you know, how do we do this and keep doing it well and maintain a spirit of inquiry and do what you're saying, Ben, about going back and and uh, kind of mining the data for um, for other insights that may not kind of fit within that rapid timeline. So it's uh, very, you know, just endless opportunities. Um, and thank you, Borsica, for pointing out the special, uh, the call for papers for a special issue on implementation pace. Um, and that link is in there. And let's go to Russ's question. Uh, what strategies do you have for implementing the great advice you have about engagement and evolution in partnerships? As Jennifer nicely articulated with the visual review group mindset about protocol including using only evidence-based strategies and fidelity to the protocol. That's quite a question, Russ. Uh, but community engaged strategies and anything else you might take away from that question. Yeah, Ben. Well, I don't have the answer, but uh, it is actually, I think there is a major issue that we need to be thinking about, which is related to that, which is when you're doing, you know, so traditional intervention studies, if you do 
rapid epigraphic assessments and other things in the middle of it, and you're change, you want the intervention to change, but that really is disruptive to a traditional clin you know, uh, trial uh, and study. I just want to he hear what you know, comments on how do you how do we manage that when so much of NIH is just so locked into thinking in traditional trial outcomes where what what uh, we're interested in is how do we learn real time and actually make changes in the middle of a study? I don't think it's a full answer, but I lean heavily on the form and function and try to really articulate what is the function and what's the evidence base for the function and acknowledge that part of the goal and what we really want is the form to change to fit the context. I, I love that. And we actually have done the same actually uh, around identifying these functions and thinking about how we can maintain fidelity to those. The other piece that we have been experimenting with is this ROYO design, which is the rollout um, implementation optimization design, uh, which is a variation on, and many of you might be very familiar with it, but it's a variation on a stepped wedge where you are allowed to make changes between rollouts and uh, we are working closely with J.D. Smith, who was one of the uh, persons writing about this and figuring out what it means in terms of statistics and everything in a study. But to me, that's naturally answering this problem that, you know, if we are going to measure these things, we should adopt and optimize and not wait the five years and then optimize. So we are experimenting with it. I don't know how it will work out, but it is, an, I think it is one of the answers to maintaining rigor, but also um, doing the work that we need to do to align to changing context. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to work with statisticians who are willing to think more ethnographically, I guess is the way I would put it, um, is how do you dive deep into these questions about what does need to change, what are we finding out, and how can we do that and still be statistically rigorous and look at prediction and things like that. And um, I'm glad Borsik is uh, experimenting in that. And that's where I would really like to go as well. So, mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people are doing that. Yeah, Larry. Yeah, there's nothing more gratifying to have a statistician say to you, you know, I was somewhat skeptical about all this qualitative stuff, but now I really get it. And when you're able to educate them um, that's also a reflection of acquisition of language and the ability to translate something else that that I think qualitative uh, investigators are really good at. But uh, you know, for years, uh, I've worked with Henrik's Brown in looking at uh, alternatives to the traditional randomized controlled trials uh, in much the same way that Borsica has been playing around with this new. Uh, rollout uh, design. Um, I, I think it's really that engagement with our quantitatively minded uh, colleagues that enables them to think about alternatives to the ways that they've been doing things as well. And that too is both transformative and I think certainly critical to the field as a whole. Absolutely. I see uh, Corey's question about um, advancing mechanisms science and implementation research? Do folks have insights about the ways that we can bring sharper alignment between mechanism science and qualitative approaches? Anyone doing mechanism related work? I am not personally so much not doing as much related. Well, what is it? Mechanisms. Um, so, and everyone, you know, weigh in with their perspectives on this, but you know, there's been quite a bit of work on how strategies are actually doing the work that they're doing and trying to kind of tease apart um, uh, uh, the strategy, the mechanisms by which strategies may produce outcomes. I was just looking at um, Enola Proctor's 10-year review of implementation outcomes last night, 
and seeing this question of we really haven't figured this out yet. How are we making these connections between implementation outcomes and system outcomes? How are we making connections between strategies and implementation outcomes? And that's a lot of the of the work going on in the mechanism area, I think quite a bit spearheaded by uh, Kara Lewis and colleagues, um, some fantastic papers about mechanisms. I, I think, you know, for me, um, and, and Aaron Finley's been doing a lot of this work uh, as well related to, um, I think, in a related area of um, strategy fidelity. Um, so I have been um, maybe a little bit more interested in how are we kind of conceptualizing the strategies that we're using? Like Jennifer, you mentioned using a lot of quality improvement oriented strategies. Um, and I do that as well. And so, it, you know, when we're comparing strategies, like in a hybrid type three trial, how are we uh, keeping the parameters of one strategy versus another distinct, so, distinct to the point where we can attribute our outcomes to one strategy or another. So we've been doing a lot of work in that area, which I think is sort of, uh, adjacent to the mechanisms, um, but uh, there's, uh, you know, other, a lot of strong thinking going on related to mechanisms as well. So um, I don't know if anyone else has thoughts about that. And then we have a couple more questions uh, in the chat as well. I, I guess I've had some conversations around it uh, with Alok Modi about um, how ethnographic um, research can be used or qualitative research can be used to put together the causal mapping. Mm. Um, and then, then you can decipher which pieces of those maybe you can apply mathematical equations to or look at causal inference, but that to really understand what the mechanisms are, that maybe qualitative research is actually a good application of um, to do that or method to do that. So maybe that's one of our in the future, uh, things that we can keep an eye on. Larry, did you have a thought to share? Yeah, well? I was going to say, uh, in, in thinking about the the work that uh, uh, Kara Lewis has been doing, uh, you know, if you ever have seen those diagrams uh, where they, you know, link uh, determinants and mechanisms to outcomes, uh, it, it almost makes me think you need to be an electrical engineer to really understand uh, what it is. And in fact, they borrowed heavily from engineering and developing those diagrams. But, you know, we've always used the argument that our strong suit is understanding things in depth, you know, uh, and compensating, uh, particularly in implementation science, for the limited power that we often have because organizations or systems or communities are the unit of analysis. But it's really, you know, in the absence of large samples uh, and going beyond uh, the, the uh, breadth of information to, if you really want to understand causal mechanisms, I, I agree with Heather that, you know, going, going deep gives us a much better sense about why things happen the way they do. Um, that a diagram, you know, it may not be uh, able to capture nearly as well. Mm -hmm. I see Andrea's uh, question, another um, anthropologist doing amazing work in implementation science. Uh, and she is curious about innovative or best practices with qualitative methods for studying sustainment, um, which is less understood and challenging to study. And I completely agree with that because often our funding runs out before we can pay sufficient attention to sustainment, even if that was the original goal, uh, speaking for myself in some of my studies. Yeah, Heather. I was just going to say, Andrea is the one doing that work. Right. <laughs> let's, watch, let's watch out for Andrea's work in that area. Yeah. So, yeah ben. One of the things I think we do too little observational work. And so kind of going in and talking to, you know, doing observations and talking to people after the intervention is over and really trying to get grasp, uh, you know, kind of what, 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 how have they adapted? What, uh, and what are they sustaining over time uh, becomes really, you know, a critical piece of that. We underutilize, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I'm an anthropologist too. So observation is like 
to me is more important than interviews in a lot of ways, but we underutilize it. Yeah, thank you for all the resources, uh, Borsica, that you're sharing. Anything that you wanna highlight um, from your exchange in the chat? I was just sharing a little bit about Royo. I think I didn't um, spell it out well, um, but I did want to mention something about sustainment. It is intriguing to me because it just came up yesterday with a discussion with Win Norton and Projecta Atsul and others on the Axis and CI funded initiative. And one thing that we discussed, and we are going to think about this more of the definition of sustainment seems to be different depending on the, the partner that you are talking with. So things that researchers found not sustained, actually the clinicians described as a sustained practice. And then, you know, there were different combinations of operational leaders thinking about sustainment differently than we thought about it as researchers. So we talked about how different perspectives should be taken into account when we define what sustainment and success might look like in this area. And I think that the only way to get to that is qualitative. I can't imagine a well, I might have not a very good imagination, but I can think of a very easy way to capture this in a quantitative way without talking with people about what they see as success in the sustainment context. So I'm very intrigued. And as you can hear my voice, super excited about learning more. Yeah, that does sound really exciting. And I think it was Wynne who many years ago got me um, really interested in the idea of pre-sustainability workshops um, mm -hmm. And just how do we even, so as you're saying, conceptualize sustainability or maintenance and how might we think about different concepts of the extent to which things stay in place and change. Um, but are there ways in which we can prepare for that as well? Um, I think is has been super interesting to, to explore. Uh, so I know we are um, coming up on our last 10 minutes or so. Uh, I, this is, as I thought it would be very interesting, and I'm guessing we could talk the entire day about all of these super interesting things. Um, I just wanted to give everyone a chance before we wrap up and I'll just share a couple slides, uh, at the end, but is there anything that, uh, beyond what we've already talked about that you see on the horizon that you're excited about that you, you've mentioned, a, a few of you have actually mentioned some some things that you're testing out and trying out, anything else that you wanna share um, in terms of your vision for, for qualitative methods going into the future? Just to- I just, just, just wanna say one thing right quick that um, I haven't been keeping up well enough, but uh, being in public health and global public health at times, it's such a different conversation we can have when we're in non-US settings. I mean, I think a lot of this work is done in VA, you know, in places, but, uh, my own experience in India and other places is you just have to, the qualitative methods will save the day more often than not. Mm -hmm. uh, but would be nice to have more conversations about that. Yeah, that's a great point, Deborah. Thanks. Uh, following up uh, on what Deborah, uh, I think one of the things we haven't mentioned today, but I think is absolutely uh, related to our previous discussion about community engagement is equity. Uh, as you all know, uh, you know there's been a very strong push uh, uh, to get the field of implementation science uh, involved in reducing health disparities and promoting health equity. That's been especially true in the global public health arena that, that Deborah has been operating in. But, but I think it's also tied to community engagement. Um, the best way to promote equity is to uh, engage those who have been disadvantaged, who are vulnerable, who lack the resources, because the, the, one of the things that qualitative research does is give them voice. Uh, and it does empower them. And uh, that too, I think, is an area that we need to think about in, in terms of the implications of the methods that we use to engage in communities does have potentially a great impact on reducing disparities. But that's a conversation that, you know, we cannot have uh, in isolation from uh, the communities that we work with. 
just very smoothly perhaps flowing into this idea of citizen science and all those different new ways that we have you know we have been experimenting with streetwise at UCSD which is one of the citizen science programs our voice uh, from Stanford from Abby King of course but then other ways that we could bring in the actual community members to give us a feedback about what they see in their own community and help us prioritize what we address. I think that that's in the realm of qualitative for me. Uh, I don't know if I'm defining it correctly, but I am very excited about seeing more of that in research proposals and, and in practice. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just add another, uh, in one of the studies under the leadership of Alex Lightfoot, um, who's a community engagement researcher, we're doing story circles with women in the community to have, and the power of a story and narrative of a woman's experience um, and feeding that back as one of our strategies in the clinic. That's exciting. Keep an eye out for that. Ben. Well, just related to that, photo voice is another way of really kind of getting into the community and engaging people uh, differently than our traditional methods. Yes, yeah, Suzanne. Um, the question of common language, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> at the time, it was an issue. There are so many disciplines involved in implementation science. There's nursing. There's psychology, there's anthropology, sociology, so many others. Um, all who come with the Oh, no, we lost you, Suzanne. Right, Heather. Do you were you going to jump in if we if we lost Suzanne to internet freezing? I could. I want want to hear what she had to say. I do too. Um, <laughs> um, I guess I just wanted to make an argument for creativity. Um, and this was a uh, a panel that we had done around ethnography and implementation science at DNI a, a while back and Larry was in the audience and he said, one of the patterns I see across all of these is the creativity uh, that was able to go into each of the study designs and how we use it. And um, I think in some other, quali I would argue some other qualitative methods, that's not as possible. And so I mm -hmm. just wanna put a plug in for um, using the creativity of ethnography. Yeah, absolutely. And Suzanne, we were on the edge of our seats with your with your comments, and then we lost you. You're on mute, though. You're on mute. <laughs> there were so many different disciplines involved with so many different languages. Do you think, and we don't have to answer this now, but has there been improvement in building a common language, because I think it's important. I don't know. Uh, we can, and we can leave with, a, we can close out with a, something that we can all ponder. Um, okay. I mean, I think to, to an extent, um, there's been some kind of norming work that's happened in relation to the qualitative methods and implementation science. Um, and I, I, I myself am not feeling uh, such a strong need for a lot more, um, you know, because I, I, I like the, all the creative ideas that we've been hearing in this session. And, um, and, you know, sometimes if we head too much toward a common language, we might lose, you know, True. the things that would fall outside. So yeah. I think it's a really interesting question for us to, to yeah. keep considering and, and where, where and when do we need that, you know, especially with uh, reporting on rigor. And that's something that um, several of us are working on in the, in the rapid method space and, you know, making sure that we're 
continuing to do good science and I think expanding what that means to all of us and how we do it. Yeah, I understand um, the idea that we want, sorry, um, <laughs> innovation and new ideas. On the other hand, we need to know that we're talking about the same thing. Right, right. Jennifer. Oh, sorry. Yeah, another area I work is systematic review of the literature and doing systematic review of qualitative findings where having a common terminology is really helpful. And I, um, but I also worry about us landing on terminology that isn't ready yet to be, you know, that needs further work. And so I want to commend the CIFR for its CIFR 2.0. And um, I think there's a great opportunity for similar work with um, the list. The, the taxonomy of implementation strategies. Absolutely. Well, uh, our time is coming to an end. Um, I'm just going to put up the slides for a quick moment, but I want to thank you all so much for joining me for this amazing beachside chat. It's great to be with you all again. I hope we can do a follow-up um, just uh, super briefly. Um, There are, and we'll have, make these available. There are so many citations of the folks who are here. Uh, these are just a few. As I said, we would need pages and pages of, of uh, space to list everyone's publications. These are just a small handful. Um, and I would highly recommend looking up everyone's work in this group, including those who were able to be with us, Deb Cohen and Laura Dam Schroeder. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for being here, engaging in this. Uh, this will be posted on our YouTube playlist. We will be sending out a very brief evaluation. Um, please fill it out because it helps us plan future sessions. And uh, I will end that sharing. And thank you all again um, for our reunion, uh, for the amazing work that you're doing. And I'm sure we'll be seeing each other in many, many spaces uh, to come in the implementation and dissemination area. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you, Allison, for organizing this. Of course, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye.